Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. Our guest today is Dr. James Christopher Haney, a conservation biologist, wildlife researcher, and author of more than 250 peer-reviewed journals, journal articles, technical reports, and science summaries. Um, his career trajectory spans the arc of conservation and extinction. And we're going to talk about both of these topics today. His formal bio will be in the show notes uh, section of our episode. But without further ado, I'd love to welcome Dr. Haney to the Bird Podcast. Thank you for participating. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> um, may I call you Chris or? Absolutely. You... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, your, uh, uh, your career arc is very interesting to people who are interested in conservation. And I'd like to go back, if I may, to one of your early papers, which we've linked to. And in, in that, you talk about 40 priorities for conservation. Now, we yes. don't have time for 40, but maybe you can mention a, a, a few as it applies to birds. Yes, that, um, that effort was a joint uh, collaboration among uh, a host of authors from different institutions to try to narrow down the top questions that conservation biology needed to answer in order to do a better job of protecting our environment. So many of these top 40 had to do with land use, water use, and particularly ecosystem services. Those, that is to say the things that we get from nature that support our life. But two I would highlight for birds. Um, the first one is how does land use and climate change affect the prevalence of disease transmission for birds? So there is a, a connection between land use and climate uh, change and disease. So in our hemisphere, we worry about things like avian malaria, which has vastly reduced Hawaiian bird populations. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, also uh, a few other mosquito-borne uh, viruses that affect birds. We had one of them uh, completely decimate our crow and jay populations when I first moved to DC. Now they bounced back, but this interaction between disease and climate change is an important one for us to understand about birds and wildlife because it has relevance to human health as well. So that's one. A second, is uh, what characteristics of bird species require our ongoing intervention to protect them in the wild. So this is the kind of conservation interventions that might not ever end. And some birds you can bring into a zoo and keep them in an aviary and maybe someday release them back into the wild. Um, We've done that with several species here in North America, including California condor and others. But what is it about the life history characteristics of these birds, how they make their living, and which traits facilitate uh, captive propagation versus, no, we can't do that. We have to keep them alive in the wild. They have some unusual thing that we just can't reproduce in a zoo. So those were some of the, the questions in our effort that related to birds. And um, what did you conclude about the second one? Are, what traits of birds would prevent them from it? <laughs> well, th this paper only brought up the questions. It didn't okay. seek the answers. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it said, you know, Fair. the focus was what questions need to be answered. Yes. Um, and, and I'm sure that for birds, it varies from one class to another. I mean, waterfowl, for example, uh, except for sea ducks, generally are quite easy to keep in captivity. Uh, things like woodpeckers, not so much. Yeah, it's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it, Chris? Because you would think that bigger birds like the California condor would have to be preserved in the wild. But as you said, they do well um, in captivity. But the woodpecker is a small bird, but <laughs> it doesn't. It is. The the, the, the California condor story, uh, and I know there have been vulture conservation issues with uh, pesticides and, and uh, other veterinary um, medicines in, in your, your part of the world. 
uh, but California condor is very vulnerable to ingestion of lead bullets. And so we still have to monitor them and sometimes actually chelate birds, bring them in and chelate them in uh, captivity until they're healthy and return to the wild. But this was a big one for me because I, I was working in Alaska at the time and the very last condor was taken from the wild and put in captivity before I ever got to see it in the wild. Now I've since seen the restored birds that have been reintroduced back, but here we have a situation in my own lifetime. I saw them almost go to extinction within perhaps a few uh, 10, 20 birds. And now they've come back and they're being introduced throughout Southern California, as well as Northern Mexico and Arizona. One of our guests was Sai Montgomery, and she's written a book about this, and she worked in a condor uh, rescue camp. But what does chelate mean? I, I don't know. Ke chelate, so when heavy metals, when, when people or animals ingest heavy metals, there is a process, um, basically a medical process, where you take these contaminants out of the blood. And so it's a, it's a very intensive and involved process. It's not something you can do in the field. It requires sophisticated veterinary facilities or a hospital in the case of humans. Um, and so if we get lead poisoning, we can be chelated and it, it can help us get better. It may not get all the lead, but it helps us uh, recover to some extent. So it's just a, a medical practice to help animals or people recover from heavy metals that they consume accidentally. Um, so moving to the next uh, aspect of your career, you've researched oil spills and bird mortality. And can you talk a little bit about that um, and the learnings from that? Yes, uh, I, I, will, I will start with a, what I hope is a slightly amusing anecdote, which is I happened to be in the wrong place uh, at the right time twice. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> uh, I lived in Alaska um, in the late 1980s, but then I moved back to the lower 48 to take an, an academic appointment there. And because of my expertise with seabirds, I was asked to participate in a long-term program to help recover all marine resources in Alaska after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. I uh, worked on that for about 10 years. And then in 2010, when we had this catastrophic blowout and massive oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. It was about the size of New York State. Wow. That's how much of the uh, ocean surface was covered by this oil over time. The Department of Interior, a uh, government agency that's in charge of bird, um, migratory bird conservation, asked me to lead a study for that as well. And I participated uh, in that part of um, the Atlantic Ocean ever since. We still have ongoing projects. So I just I didn't seek out um, the opportunity to work with oil spills, but my early expertise with seabirds uh, led to my being invited twice. And over time I became uh, sort of sought after for how, what do we do when an accidental spill occurs in the ocean? How do we estimate the damages to birds? How do we calculate or compute that, estimate it? And then what might we do in, in order to recover those bird populations that have been so uh, heavily impacted. And you worked in your, I read your paper, you worked with carcass, uh, the, the carcasses of birds and you made some uh, conclusions about which birds rebound and which don't or take more time. Yes. So there, there are basically two ways to estimate how many birds get killed by spilled oil at the ocean surface. One way is to go along the beach, along the shoreline and pick up as many carcasses as possible and then work backwards from that. Estimate things like, well, how many did predators take? How many did the tides bring in depending upon current directions and so forth? And then how many might've been lost at sea before they ever got to shore? That's a very involved, process. It takes a lot of field effort. One has to cover the shorelines about every day in order to collect the birds because, you know, in our part of the world, things like foxes and 
raccoons and even larger birds will consume the smaller ones that wash up. So it's very complicated and it's subject to very wide uncertainty. Mm -hmm. The other technique is if we have information about how many birds are out at sea, how big an area the oil covered and what proportion of birds might have been in contact with that oil. And that's called, uh, the first one I described as a carcass deposition model. This one is called an exposure probability model. And it only requires three variables. And those are rather e easier to get or to estimate. Um, and that's, we use both techniques in part of the Gulf of Mexico. And we actually found quite similar results. So for coastal waters out to about 40 kilometers from shore, we estimated that on the order of about half a million birds were killed uh, by that oil spill. Oh my word. <laughs> yes. A tangential question, given your expertise with seabirds, and this is, I know it's a very broad question and I hope it won't be meaningless. I live in, in interior uh, Bangalore, so I don't have oceans or seas around. I don't have access to it and I'm fascinated by seabirds. Um, broad question, what, what makes seabirds different from shore birds? Oh, <laughs> my, that's my perfect question. Uh, my favorite one. Uh, oh, they're so fascinating. So they differ from most of our land birds in a couple of really just fascinating ways. One, they're very long lived. So in, in my country, things like robins or cardinals, they may only live two or three years. Uh, and, you know, they'll produce nests and young over that, but they, they don't live long. In contrast, some of the albatrosses we now have evidence that they live at least 70 years. So seabirds are long lived. And that means that their lifetime reproduction success could be quite high. That means if they can breed every year, they can put out lots of babies um, for, for compared to some birds. An another thing that's really fascinating about seabirds is they take a long time to grow up a little bit like some teenagers in my country these days. <laughs> uh, they stick around for a while. So again, whereas our land birds and songbirds, uh, they hatch this year, they can come back next year and breed. But some seabirds take three, four, five, even seven or eight years in order to get to reproductive age. So they, and during that time, they can be wandering the ocean and never come back to land. So that's yeah. a second feature. A third is that they, typically have what we call very small clutches, yeah. meaning they only lay one or two eggs. They don't have, they're not like waterfowl, for example, ducks and geese that might have 15 eggs, uh, generally only one. Um, and they're, they also typically have high survival for birds, meaning that um, given all of the risks that birds face out in nature, the predators and the environment, the climate change, weather, um, seabirds tend to uh, actually have high annual survival, meaning that their likelihood of going from one year to the next is quite high for birds. So th this combination of traits, plus they're just mysterious because they're out there out of our view on the ocean for so long, um, has just fascinated a number of us because we want to try to understand how they do this. Yeah. And that's really, uh, that was my first love, if you will, uh, in ornithology when I was in graduate school. I started in seabirds and I've been able to uh, maintain some connection with them ever since. Um, one question before we move on to the topic of your book. Are there particular species of seabirds that you find fascinating? Yes, the genus Pterodroma. So pterodroma are medium-sized petrels about the size of a small gull. And they're in the same family as albatrosses and storm petrels and shearwaters. They typically breed in tropical or middle latitudes. They don't typically stray too far in the Arctic or too far south in the Antarctic. And for me, they're kind of the consummate seabird. They're the epitome of what a seabird should do. They can drink seawater and ex 
excrete the salt through their nostrils. They never have to be around fresh water. They can use the wind to soar without moving their wings for hours or even days if it's windy enough. And they're magnificent to watch. So if you're on a ship and you see a gadfly petrel, that's the common name, or a pterodroma petrel, they arc sometimes 50 to 100 feet in the air. Then they swoop down close to the ocean and then back up again. And when you see them in that fashion, they're just marvelous to watch. When you get closer and watch them feeding on a dead squid at the surface, they squabble and fight and they're kind of messy, just like uh, seagulls would be, but they, they, they're in the air, they're extremely graceful. Um, you've led a prestigious aspect uh, or a program in the Nature cons Conservancy, and that's fascinating to Indians because their model, which is to just buy up swaths of land, it's always, we always wonder in dense countries like India is, is that possible? Can it be replicated in countries such as Asia, in countries in Asia and Africa? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, that what, what works, what doesn't work, what can be replicated from your tenure at the Nature Conservancy? Sure. Um, well, I, I do think that land protection reserves, preserves national parks, um, even game reserves where some form of sustainable hunting is allowed. I think all of those have to be part of our overall conservation strategy, but they're not enough. And so I, what has fascinated me is what I would call mixed models of land conservation. So systems where you might have a very large national park that can offer some protection, but then working with local communities and indigenous peoples around the periphery that have to make a living and finding ways to coexist with wildlife that, as we say, stray off the reservation. They won't stay behind the fences in a game park or in a national park. So that's led me to spend considerable time in Southern Africa. It's a place that I just adore visiting. Um, and it, it does this mixed model approach quite well. Uh, now there is a lot of land and a lot of fairly open land in Southern Africa. And so the population density is lower, but even here in North America, I'm fascinated by how we coexist with wildlife in a mixture of public and private uh, lands or private programs that help people make a living next to public lands. So I would say both are essential. In India, there's a, an organization called the Nature Conservation Foundation or NCF. Um, it's situated in a place called Valparai where there are tea estates and elephants. And they use, um, the elephants wander into tea plantations and they use SMS. Uh, they just send a text messages to the tea planters and the tea workers saying elephant in tea estate nine. So take a different route or they have the blinking lights uh, from electricity poles to tell people even without a phone to say, don't go there because there's an elephant. Um, exactly. And th that is, that's the very kind of program that I, uh, I guess my heart is closest to hmm. because it allows uh, our interests with agriculture and crops and personal safety to be addressed, but also it, it, it enables the wildlife to survive. We do this with wolves here in North America. Uh, it turns out that a certain kind of plastic ribbon hung from fences will keep them from going into the corrals and taking sheep or cattle or having a guard dog present mm -hmm. will also keep the wolves at bay. And that's just a much better strategy than the wolves getting in trouble and then having to be killed. Um, so those, we call them proactive measures because they anticipate the problem and are ready to it before it kind of becomes a problem. And I, I just think that that is the, the very best way to go with wildlife. Hmm. So I was reading your work, I was reading many of your articles and I came across a Shakespearean illusion. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this Romeo error that you're talking about? Well, it is a, it's a, a fascinating thing. And if, if it's okay, I thought maybe I would share with you a couple of slides oh, yeah. and we could 
we'll start off with uh, what the Romeo heir is, and it is definitely Shakespearean, and it's actually potentially tragic as well with birds and bird conservation. And then I'll give some examples of birds from around the world. Please. All right. Yeah, here we're doing the screen sharing. All right. So I'll, I'll start up with what is Romeo Error? And it is named after Shakespeare's famous play. And if you remember towards the ending of this play, what happened is that Romeo, uh, his last name was Montague, and the Montagues and the Capulets were feuding. They were uh, families that had lots of disputes between them. But these two young lovers, one from each family, Juliet from the Capulets and Romeo from the Montagues were in love with each other. Well, Romeo showed up at the Capulet family crypt and saw Juliet lying in what he thought was a death pose, but she, was, she had taken a potion and she was merely asleep or in a coma. In his grief, because he thought that she was dead, thought, didn't test it, he just thought that she was dead, he ended up killing himself. When she awoke and saw that he was dead, then she also took her own life. So we had sort of this double tragedy uh, in this very famous play. Now, in wildlife conservation and bird conservation, the Romeo error is when we conclude that a bird is extinct. It's dead. All, all individuals of that species are gone. They're all dead. But it actually isn't. There are still individuals that are alive. And the potential tragedy in this is if we say, ah, that species is gone, it's dead, and we withdraw the protections that were in place, it might put even more jeopardy on those birds or wildlife and increase the risk of them actually going extinction. And it turns out that this problem in conservation biology is very prevalent. The Romeo error is. Um, since the last 120 or 30 years, 350 to 400 species of vertebrates have been refound or rediscovered, thought extinct, and then re refound. So what I'll do now is I'll show, I'll go through some of the examples of birds, including some from India and also from my corner of the world. Let's see. Okay, so these are lost birds that were once claimed extinct but later found. We're gonna start off with the, what I would call the most quickly rediscovered. This beautiful little bird is called the Gurney's Pitta. It's a denizen of Myanmar and Thailand. Um, Gurney's Pitta went missing in 1952, but it was refound in 1986. So that's a fairly short period that it was gone from us, 34 years. Hmm. This next bird is a kind of finch. It's the Antiochoa brush finch found in the Colombian Andes, Andes Mountains of South America. It went missing in 1971, refound in 2018. It was missing almost half a century, 47 years. This, this is a, 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 a drab little bird, but one that got a lot of attention in the media a few years back. Uh, it's called the Jordan's Babbler. It's also another bird denizen inhabitant of Myanmar. Went missing in 1941, refound in 2014 for a total gap of 73 years missing. This is a beautiful bird. It is the blue-eyed ground dove. It's found in the Cerrado of Brazil. It went missing in 1941, refound in 2015, missing 74 years, so just a year longer than the previous bird, the Jordan's babbler. This is a, an especially interesting bird because this was the catalyst, the instigator of the term Romeo error as applied to birds. 
and it's called the Cebu flower picker. The only place it lives in the world is one island of the Philippines of the same name, Cebu Island, went missing just after the turn of the previous century, 1909, but it was rediscovered 83 years later. And what made this fascinating is it was thought that all of the forest of this island was removed, it was gone. There were just ragged fragments of trees here and there. And yet this bird managed to survive. Eventually they found at least three or four separate locations on the island where this bird survived. And Nigel Collier and others use this as an example of the Romeo error in birds. This is another fascinating one and also has its own little quirky story about why it went missing. It's called the Dumar flycatcher. Uh, it is found only on the island of the same name in Indonesia. It was originally found, collected, and taken back to European museums in the Victorian era in 1898 and then went dark. It was rediscovered more than 100 years later. And when it was found, it turned out that it was just not all that rare. It was actually widespread on that island. So sometimes the fact that we think birds are gone, missing or extinct is due purely to the fact that we're not looking for them or not looking well. Uh, let's go to the next one. Ah, this is another one because it has a, a really important story to tell us in conservation biology. Uh, it is called the Bangai Crow. It is a resident of central Sulawesi uh, in Indonesia. And it went missing in 1900 and it was refound in 2007. Again, another bird that was missing for a whole century. One of the things that might have contributed to this bird sort of hiding from us is there's another corvid, another crow on that island called the slender-billed crow. And if you're not paying close attention, you might not try to separate the two crows. And so it might have been lurking right below our perceptual radar. You know, we just weren't paying good attention. If you've noticed a pattern, the time, the gaps between these birds get longer and longer as I go around. And this one uh, is, I'm sure, quite well known to many of your viewers. This is the Indian forest owlet, uh, a rather mysterious and enigmatic bird. It was also found and discovered in the late 1800s but not refound until 1997, missing for a total of 113 years. Uh, yet another species that uh, has part of its range in India is the large-billed reed warbler, uh, missing in 1867, refound in 2006, gone for 139 years. Now I'm gonna close with guess what, Shoba? Two seabirds. <laughs> <laughs> I have to come back to my favorite group because they actually illustrate this Romeo error in ways that are just, just I think, uh, completely remarkable. We're right. going to start off with we're going to start off with this tiny little swallow-sized bird. It's a, called the New Zealand storm petrel. It's probably only its body length is only about this this long. Really small bird. It was uh, discovered and cataloged just by three specimens in 1850, meaning that its discovery predated Charles Darwin's origin of the species. So that's when the bird was discovered and boom, whoosh, it went completely quiet and silent on us. It was not discovered again, not seen again until 153 years later, a century and a half, it was out of our view. Well, that's a long time. It makes for kind of an interesting story, but it gets better. When it was discovered, when the breeding grounds for this little seabird were discovered, they were found to be on islands less than 40 kilometers away from Auckland, New Zealand's largest city. So this bird managed to hide from our perception right next to a very large city, that country's largest, 40 kilometers away. Now, to me, 
At this point, I would start getting a little humble about our ability to predict extinction. Mm -hmm. um, we're not real good at it. And that's actually a mind trick. We can come to that if we have time. But the, I guess the grandfather of all missing birds is a not only a seabird, it is in that genus that I talked about, Pterodroma, Shoba. It's called the Bermuda petrel. Its scientific name is Pterodroma cahau. Cahau is also a common name. It went missing in 1620, and it was rediscovered in the early 1900s, missing for more than 300 years. And that was on a small, densely populated island off the southeastern United States, one that's full of people, one that tourists go to. Um, it's, there are not a lot of places to hide in this very small island group. And yet, a few tens of these birds managed to survive for 300 years. So this tells us, basically, that our ability to certainly know when a bird is extinct is fallible. We guess, and we guess wrongly in many cases. Is this a hopeful story? That you, because many of the birds that we think are extinct may be rediscovered, or what is what is your takeaway? Well, um, it it off it's a mixed it's a mixed bag or a mixed story. It does offer hope. It does suggest that we ought to um, treat animal extinctions much like we do human death. We don't assume that someone is dead if they go missing for a while. If I haven't seen my uncle Bob for 10 years, I don't assume that he's dead. I have to be uh, aware of evidence. And of course, if one works in human medicine in a hospital, even if someone is at death's door, we exert every effort we can to help them survive. Mm -hmm. And the problem, um, so while we have hope that some species might be refound, there's still enough that we know have gone extinct to be troubling. Mm -hmm. But we should also be troubled about putting birds into the grave too soon. Mm -hmm. um, if we do, the Romeo error suggests that we might take away their protections, forget about it, and actually put the, the lingering survivors at more risk. So I think it's quite a cautionary tale. It's telling us that our minds don't know everything and that we should be, we should wait until we have enough evidence of death in, in, in wildlife conservation. And the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation and Nature, BirdLife International have outstanding standards for this. One basically has to come up with enough surveys to show that a bird is missing, truly missing. Uh, I wish we used those standards all the time in, you, in the United States, but unfortunately we don't. Hmm. Um, you talked about uh, cognitive biases and all the, f uh, the human mind being fallible, which brings us to the topic of your latest book, uh, Woody, as um, you call it. Um, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the ivory-billed woodpecker and why it fascinates you so much. Yeah, so this was, um, the, the ivory-billed woodpecker is a very large woodpecker in the genus Campephalus, which normally has a a distribution in the tropics. It's always been enigmatic and mysterious. It's never divulged all of its secrets to us. It didn't 100 years ago or 200 years ago. It's always uh, confounded and frankly tricked us into thinking that we know more about it than we do. I became interested because when I was a young lad, my maternal grandfather worked as a book salesman, and he would give me these old uh, 19th century books about birds. And I would, I couldn't wait to uh, my birthday or Christmas and I would open them up and start reading about these birds I would never see. Cal uh, well, the Labrador duck, the great auk, the Carolina parakeet, passenger pigeons, birds that mostly went extinct before the American frontier had closed and we became more of a settled nation living in cities and so forth. And I always just assumed 
for the ivory billed woodpecker was in that canon of gone birds. It was just, I never gave it too much thought all of my life. But that changed in about 2004 or five when a putative ivory bill woodpecker was rediscovered, much like these um, missing birds that I described a few moments ago in a place called the Big Woods of Arkansas. Well, that was a startling enough news in itself. But then I started to watch people's reaction to this rediscovery, and I could not make any sense of it. I saw people doing the essential equivalent of yelling at each other over whether the bird really was an ivory bill. I saw them angry and disputing and calling each other names. And I was like, it's just a bird. This is just a bird, you know, dead or alive. It's just a bird. We're not talking about, oh, I don't know, politics or religion or, you know, and, and so I, I, that fascinated me. And as I started to peer closer at this, I started to find that in the modern era, in the last few decades, the way we describe this bird is different than the way it was described 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And I couldn't figure that out either. I was thinking, well, doesn't everybody have access to these books and these accounts? So where, where's all this coming from? It was just a puzzle to me. I didn't actually set out to write a book. Um, I was just trying to, you know how we scientists are curious about little things. And so we'll follow the threads until we get to the end and mm. get the, the resolution. Mm. And that's what I thought this would be. But it led me into a 15 year journey about how our minds work mm. when there are, there's a great deal of uncertainty. And what I found is that this bird has always had so much uncertainty attached to it that it tricks us. And it tricks us in at least 53 different ways, <laughs> which yeah. is why I call my book Woody's Last Laugh, because the woodpecker's getting the last laugh on us, whether it's dead or alive, it yeah. still manages to trick us. Yeah. And we started declaring this bird extinct in 1913. And we're still doing it because our Fish and Wildlife Service formally declared it extinct and is going to remove it or proposing to remove it from the endangered species list uh, just this fall. That was the proposal put forward. And I laughed because it was like, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask you, yeah, about that. Yeah. But um, mental model books, I, I mean, uh, lots of them thinking fast, thinking slow. Uh, yes. There's columns and there's reams that nudge um, Richard Taylor, all of his work. But you, your book is special. It's, uh, as you say, it's one of the earliest books, if not the first book, which applies mental models to our, uh, ornithology and wildlife. So if yes. you had to pick from the 53, um, and choose uh, two or three that applies to ornithology, which ones would they be? Well, I think one that applies uh, to bird extinctions quite profoundly, I think, is something called the negativity bias. It, it turns out that our minds are not just happy, optimistic places. We actually, if we're given a choice between a positive and a negative, interpretation of something, we, our minds instinctually go to the negative. So what this means, if we're thinking of an animal, a bird, is it alive, is it dead? The dead story has more power in us. It has more force. It grips us, seizes and holds our attention much more than life. And so they don't start, those two prospects, life and death, don't start off on equal footing inside our heads. So we have to be careful to guard against rushing to extinction too fast, too soon, because of that negativity bias. That's a, a big problem in extinction and conservation. A couple, though, affect ornithology uh, profoundly. And I'm going to pick one that affects both just casual or recreational bird watching and scientific ornithology both. Uh, 
One that is quite prevalent is something called the observer expectancy effect. It's a kind of confirmation bias where we go out and see what we want to see. And it turns out that both people who are casually bird watching and people that are gathering data on uh, scientific studies for birds, both tend to overinflate the number of rare species found. So our minds are always looking for the thing that doesn't fit, you know, the rare species that doesn't belong. And it's not to say that we don't sometimes find rare species, we do, but we tend to inflate or exaggerate that beyond what is actually there. So we, uh, this affects both birding and ornithology and it's a, a real struggle to uh, train observers in the field to uh, mitigate or try to um, prevent that bias from kind of running away. Uh, that's a big one. In scientific ornithology, there's a worse one. In fact, it, it's all over science. It's something called the congruence bias. I don't illustrate it with you, Shoba. Tell me the next number in this sequence. One, three, five, seven. Nine. But what if I tell you the next number was 14? Huh. I would have to think so, twice. Yes. So what we do with our minds is we take shortcuts to try to find a pattern that makes a good story for us. When we don't come up with enough hypotheses for a pattern, that's called the congruence bias. So in fact, that number sequence could have been odd numbers, prime numbers, whole numbers, integers. It could have been anything. It wasn't long enough yet for us to see. And so when we rush to one hypothesis and exclude the other things that could account for something, that's called the congruence bias. It's very, very common. It's the hardest one for me to keep in mind. I, I really struggle with it. And even in my seabird research, I find I constantly have to guard against it. How, how would you apply it to birding? So I get what you're saying that we have these patterns and we take shortcuts. So you are doing sea research on seabirds. How does it play out? I'll give you an example. When we we, we started a very large and long-term study of seabirds in the Gulf of Mexico. It was a partnership among multiple federal agencies, including National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and so forth. And we discovered something odd. We found um, this very large seabird called the brown booby. It is, uh, its scientific name is Sula leucogaster, and it was everywhere in the Gulf of Mexico. We looked in the historical counts, other studies, smaller scale studies, no one mentioned it. It wasn't widespread, it was not common. And we went, what's going on? Why are there so many? And why are they in the middle in pelagic waters, way far from shore? Because it's thought that this is a more coastal seabird for the most part. So we were puzzling on that and I had a, I thought it was a very clever, and a very sophisticated hypothesis, and it went like this. Uh, I, I think we've got a good story for why this bird is showing up. It's because of all the oil wells, all of the structures. When the bird gets tired, it can perch on those uh, oil platforms out there in the ocean, go out and fish, come back and rest, preen its feathers and get everything arranged, and just be happy. And I, we, we were fully prepared to write a paper on this and go, this is what we think is going on because 20 years ago, this bird just wasn't here. Well, this summer I had the privilege of going and studying seabirds on the other side, the Atlantic from Florida up to, oh, roughly the latitude of New Jersey. And guess what? This area has no oil platforms. But guess what bird was out there really far from land? The brown <laughs> booby. <laughs> so I thought, uh oh, there that shoots my that shoots my theory completely. And I, it taught me, ah, I felt a congruence bias. Yeah. I didn't come up with enough hypotheses to begin with. So we're back to the drawing board on why this bird has become so much more common and widespread. I mean, that is a, a hopeful story to find more of them, but. We, we still, we're, we're unsure why. 
you know, one of the, this, what you just said, you know, um, emphasizes something that comes up again and again in the bird podcast with our experts, because uh, I'm an amateur birder. And when I go out on the field, everybody is focused on e-bird lists and amassing numbers. Whereas what you say, looking for patterns, looking for behavior, looking for ecology, I think it requires that you get away from the numbers, get away from the cameras and the binoculars and observe. And this is something you talk about in an interesting way in one of your earlier talks, and I didn't quite understand it. You say that in the past, the people didn't have binoculars, they didn't have the, uh, the tools, and now they, they have everything, but yet we trust the information from the past more than we do. I, I listened to it, but please explain to me what you mean. Yes, yeah, so whenever we weight either earlier evidence or later evidence differently. So in the case of history, if we give more credibility to observations in the past mm -hmm. than we do in the present, mm -hmm. that's a, a bias called serial position effect. Specifically, it's called primacy effect. We give more preference, we give more weight to the earlier data less weight or maybe even no weight to the later. Now, sometimes that can be flipped. Sometimes we'll give more credence to later information and give none at all to the earlier. And that's called a recency effect. And some of us, our minds work like this. It's easier for us to remember the first things we heard or the last things. Mm -hmm. That's how that serial position effect. You know, we have something in our country called social security numbers. It's the number that we use for employment and so forth. And I, for some reason, I'm usually for paperwork, it asks us for the last four digits. But I always have to start at the beginning <laughs> and go all the way through. And so what that's telling is me is that I more easily remember the first string of information the earliest parts rather than the latest. So I fall, in that case, I'm falling to a primacy effect. Mm. So that was what I was describing in my book. You, you brought up something else that's quite fascinating, and that is, um, depending upon our social identity, if we identify more as a bird watcher as opposed to an ornithologist or a conservation biologist or a statistician or a, a, a media reporter that covers environmental stories, what I discovered about the ivory bill woodpecker is that each of those social identities sees a different bird. It's not the same. Hmm. How fascinating. And each of them expect to see a different bird. And if the ivory bill woodpecker doesn't behave like those expectations, the outcome of the decisions and the views can be quite different. So for example, uh, competitive bird watchers in the United States do not believe in any possibility of a still living ivory bill woodpecker. But if you had a jury over here of population ecologists and they had numbers and a little bit of information about the bird's life and its, its nesting and clutch size and they put it together and they've actually done this and they would go, it's not a big deal for a few tens of birds to survive for a hundred years. That happens. We know it happens. So it's plausible to them, but not to this group. And it, it's really humbled me to learn how much our beliefs and our identities influence the natural world that we see. So I can be looking at the same thing. You can be looking at the same thing, our friends, and we might all see something rather different. Hmm. But is the ivory-billed woodpecker, are you using it as sort of a template? Can this apply to any other bird or is there something special about the ivory-billed woodpecker? Well, it, it, I, I thought so. And then I fell to the congruence bias and then I discovered another bird that plays the same kinds of mind tricks. So I think my hypothesis about why the ivory bill is such a trickster goes like this. Uh, we've never known very much about it. It was always enigma. You can read the early naturalists and they say, this puzzles me. I, I'm not seeing what my colleagues saw. What's going on here? 
And it's been rare enough that it's just below our easy detection. It's so rare, and I don't know if it's still extant or not. Um, we, we don't have any, we've never had any good numbers about how many ivory builds there were, but it's just below our perception. And when our minds don't have enough information, we fill in the gaps, we make things up. And so that bird, at first I thought, well, the ivory bill might be one of those rare birds. It's also very shy and elusive. It, it, it would avoid people um, when it was persecuted. You put those together, small numbers and elusive behavior. Well, it's not surprising people don't see it very often. And I thought, well, well, but that I was bothered by that because I'm always bothered when there's only one sample of anything in nature. It sounds too much like wishful thinking, hopeful thinking. And then I found there's another bird on the other side of the world that does the same thing to conservation biologists, ornithologists, and birders. It's called the night parrot in Australia. And the parallels, I go through those in my book, but the parallels between this other rare bird and uh, the rare, possibly extinct ivory bill woodpecker are eerie. It was originally discovered and described by Victorian era museum collectors. Um, each of those birds had one person that went out and shot the majority of them. You know, it, one guy who was really determined to go get all those birds with his shotgun and then sell them to museums around the world. And then they went dark on us for almost the same amount of time, roughly three quarters of a century. So between uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and today, roughly, uh, there was this big gap where there was no, no sightings or nothing that was accepted anyway, much the same as our ivory bill. And people even reacted angrily the same way. You didn't see a night parrot, that's impossible. But I'm going to tell your listening audience, I'm going to give them a, an incentive to keep looking for rare birds. The fellow in Australia that eventually found the night parrot, Shoba, he traveled 325,000 kilometers driving for 15 years before he found the bird. <laughs> that is an incentive. So keep keep on so, looking. Yes, but it does tell us that um, sometimes things can be so rare yeah. or so elusive that the amount of effort that it takes to find them is going to be prohibitive. Most of us just never would have such time. Be curious to see what kept him going, or whether whether it was just an accident he was looking for. No, he was he was quite dedicated. He he's his name is John Young. Yeah. And it's interesting because ivory bill woodpecker searchers in our country are rather remarkable individuals because they must have this dedication to keep looking for something that everybody else is telling them is dead. Yeah. And I have found that they often share a set of common traits. They don't much care what people think of them. They're not as subject to peer pressure and they're very dogged, they're very determined, just like Mr. Young was in Australia. Um, he didn't know the bird was there. He just kept looking and looking, looking. He, he finally got a decent photograph of the bird. Yeah. I was just thinking that these are traits that will change the world. And in fact, they have because these- Yes. Uh, species out of uh, disappearance. Uh, my last question to you is something that I ask all my guests, and most of them dislike the question, but I ask it anyway. <laughs> and the short version is, what is your favorite bird species? But for you, it's uh, much bigger because you've gone Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Jamaica, Dominican Republic, Puerto. I mean, the, there's a long list of countries you've visited. So then I'm going to say, can you name two or one or three bird species I that you love? I'll give you two and I'll give you the reasons and even the circumstance. So uh, a number of years back, I was privileged to lead a, a small group of friends and acquaintances on a safari in Southern Africa. And we were, um, we, we must have been in the Western or Northern park of it, uh, part of Itasha National Park in Namibia. 
We actually got lost. I, I thought I knew where I was driving and I didn't. And fortunately we had plenty of fuel and we were just driving through the Namibian wilderness and drove and drove and drove and drove. And finally I realized, oh, I, I think I made a mistake. Everyone was laughing. I said, let's turn around and go back. And when we did, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye and it, we all stopped. We had two cars and we would communicate by radio, two trucks, two four wheel drives. And I said, folks, look out the left-hand side. You will there see the very largest bird in the world next to the heaviest flying bird in the world. And so in this grassland savanna of Southern Africa, we saw the ostrich next to the Cory Bustard, which is this giant game bird. And it was just such, um, such a, a captivating moment to see both of these uh, big, big birds uh, right next to each other feeding in this grassland. And, and you know, I have so many favorite birds, but I think if I combine favorite episode with favorite birds, that would be it. That's a great story. And it's also great because the great Indian bustard in India was one of our I iconic ornithologist Salim Ali's favorite, one of his favorite birds. In fact, he wanted it to be India's national bird instead of the peacock. So on that very lo lovely story. And I want to thank you, Chris, for being part of the bird podcast. My pleasure. And thank you for having me, Shola. Okay. Bird Podcast is produced by Ullas Anand and Echo Edu. I'm Shobha Narayan. Thank you for listening.